There is only one issue that, in my opinion, absolutely settles the conflict in and of itself. And that is our thesis topic this evening. Did the Son, as a divine person, not as an idealized plan, not as a thought in the Father's mind, but as a divine person aware of his own existence and the existence of the Father and the Spirit, exist prior to the incarnation itself, that is, in eternity past? Our question is very simple. If the Son, as a divine person, engaged in activities that only a person can engage in prior to the incarnation, prior to his birth in Bethlehem, then we have clearly a refutation of the oneness position. For the whole aspect this evening will be, is there a Unitarian understanding of monotheism? That is, there is only one person that shares the one being of God or a Trinitarian understanding of monotheism, where you have the one being that is God, infinite and eternal, shared by three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Everyone here this evening is a monotheist. I am not just a conceptual monotheist, I am a confessional monotheist and a functional monotheist. The question is, does the Bible teach that that one being, that one eternal being that is God, is that shared by three persons? Or is that one being of God shared by only one person who takes different modes or relationships to his creation? I want to go to the Bible because I believe the Bible is the foundational document of the Christian faith. What I believe, I believe because the Bible teaches it. I am a biblical Trinitarian. It would be much easier to adopt a different perspective. But I believe in sola scriptura, the scripture alone is the sole infallible rule of faith of the church, and tota scriptura, I must believe all that scripture teaches. And so I must harmonize all of the divine revelation. I cannot pick and choose. I cannot put one part of the revelation over another part of the revelation. I must allow God's word to speak. And so I truly believe that the debate this evening will be decided in the inspired text itself, I hope that you agree with me on that important issue this evening. Let's take a look at the Carmen Christi, the hymn to Christ as God, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following. Let me just remind you, this is a sermon illustration. The Apostle Paul is exhorting the Philippians to humility of mind, that they are to not look on their own things alone, but to look to the things of others. Even though the Christians have equality with one another, they're to lay aside that equality in the service of others. And so what do we have? Philippians 2, 5 through 11. You must have the same mindset among yourselves that was in Christ Jesus, who although he eternally existed in the very form of God, and morphe theu hu parkon, he existed in God's form. It's the same word that's going to be used of his entering into servanthood. If he was a true human, a true servant, then he was truly God, who although he eternally existed in the very form of God, did not consider, that is a word of something that a person does, to consider something, to think about something, that's what a person does, did not consider that equality he had with God the Father, something to be held on to at all costs, but instead he made himself nothing, kanao means to make oneself literally empty, but Paul never uses it that way, he always uses it metaphorically, and so he makes himself nothing, and how does he do so? The amazing thing is it's not by ridding himself of anything, but by taking something on, by taking on the very form of a slave, there's Morphe again, by being made in human likeness. So what is the nature of the sons? Notice he says, he made himself. That's a reflective pronoun. This is something the son does. The son makes himself nothing by taking on human flesh. This is the great humiliation. He who has been worshipped by, by the angels in heaven, who was seen by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, worshipped by the seraphim, the cherubim, he takes on a human nature. He invades his own creation. And having entered into human existence, he humbled himself, again, something he does, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death one dies on a cross. Because of this, God the Father exalted him to the highest place and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, 
So that at the mention of the exalted name of Jesus, everyone who is in heaven and on earth and under the earth bows the knee, and every tongue confesses Jesus Christ is kurios. The very same term used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament of the name of God, Yahweh, Jesus the Messiah is kurios, but notice, all to the glory of God the Father. The confession of the exalted status of Jesus also results in the glory of God the Father. Now we have in these words clear indication of the pre-existence of the Son prior to the Incarnation. Christian exegetes down through the centuries have understood the passage to refer to the period prior to the Incarnation when the Son had equality with the Father in heaven itself. But oneness advocates say this passage refers to the time of Jesus' human ministry. If, in fact, the passage refers to the period before the incarnation of Christ, then it is plain that the Son pre-existed as a person, was active and divine, and hence the debate is concluded for the Trinitarian position is established. Now remember, gave consideration, made himself of no reputation. These are acts of a person, not acts of a plan. If the Son could consider his relationship with the Father... And in light of that, not hold on to that equality he had, but voluntarily lay it aside so as to take on a human nature. Isn't that exactly what Paul is telling the Christians to do? Don't look to your own things. Yes, you have equal rights, but lay them aside in the service of others. You want the greatest example of that? Look at the Son, who is eternally equal with the Father, and yet... For the glory of the triune God and the service of us, believe it or not, he lays aside those rights that are his, he enters into human existence, and he becomes obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. I also point out to you, the one who became obedient to the point of death is the one who had equality with the Father. That means this is clearly before the incarnation. The verbs tell the story. Have this attitude that was also in Christ Jesus, who although he eternally existed, not just as a plan, but he truly existed in the very form of God, did not consider action of a human, uh, action of a person, that equality he had with God the Father something to be held on to at all costs, but instead he made himself nothing, action of a person, by entering into human flesh, that's the incarnation, by being made in the likeness of men. The verbs tell the story, this one was pre-existent and active as a person. This is clearly what is being said. Syntactically, Paul presents two verbal clauses separated by, by the adversative but, a law in verse 7. The actions of existing and consider equality go together. This is important since to consider is the action of a person. The key verb is made himself nothing. The possession of equality took place before the emptying. Taking the form of a servant describes the means of the made himself nothing, as does being made in human likeness. Jesus was made in the likeness of men, not on the night of his betrayal when he serves the apostles or at any other point. He is made in the likeness of men at the incarnation, not at a time later in his ministry. Therefore, this passage teaches the deity of Christ, he exists in the form of God, as well as the distinct personhood of the Son prior to the Incarnation. The Son, as the Son, distinguishable from the Father, has eternally existed as a divine person. There is the first text that we will need to look at very, very carefully this evening. The next text we will need to look at, John chapter 17, John chapter 17, we will be focusing upon verse 5, obviously all of John 17, from my perspective is vitally important in the oneness debate. For I truly believe that the prayers of Jesus are one of the greatest stumbling blocks that stands in the way of anyone accepting as biblical oneness teaching. The idea that in the prayers of Jesus, this is an internal conversation within one person who's actually two persons, so that the human side is praying to the divine side simply doesn't work because in these prayers, Jesus not only refers to his pre-existence, but he refers to himself in terminology that can only be in reference to deity. But if he's praying, 
then it's the human side, which is non-deity, that is doing the praying. And hence, the prayers of Jesus have truly been, I think, the greatest refutation down through history of all forms of modalism in their anti-Trinitarian expression. John chapter 17, verses 3 through 5 say, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I simply suggest to you, before we look any more closely at the text, that in any normative human language, any normative human language, that text presents one person speaking to another person. I don't think there's any question about it at all. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God. So he's referring to the deity. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, well, to have eternal life is to know two persons? Yes, two persons. But Jesus Christ is distinguished because he's the one speaking. And he is sent. And he says, you have sent. Then I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now he identifies who he's referring to specifically. Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In any normative human language, that is one person making reference to another person. Now, look at the text even more closely. Given the personal pronouns, there is no question that these are the words of one person speaking to another person. You have direct address, Father, me, the person speaking recognizes his own personhood. Yourself recognizes the personhood of the Father. The glory which I had with you before the world was. He's talking about a period of time where the Father and the Son existed together, and it's before the world was. Same time period we saw in the Carmen Christi. Together with yourself, a truly divine glory Glorify me, if, if, if this is just a human nature speaking, then can human natures request to be glorified with a glory which they had in the presence of the Father before they ever came into existence? This is a truly divine glory. No plan or idealized concept can speak, let alone speak like this, of clearly divine and personal pre-existence. A.T. Robertson wrote, with thine own self, para se auto, by the side of thyself. That's Robertson speaking. He's referring to the normal spatial use of, use of the preposition para. Jesus prays for full restoration to the pre-incarnate glory and fellowship, referring to John 1.1, 1, 1, enjoyed before the incarnation, John 1.14, the word became flesh. This is not just ideal pre-existence, but actual and conscious existence at the Father's side, para soy, with thee. Now you can tell Robertson wrote a while back because we don't normally say thee and thou much anymore, but that's okay. What's his point? The point is that the, the words would have to be taken in a grossly unnatural way if what we actually have here is something about an idealized plan speaking Idealized plans do not look back upon a time before their fruition and say, back then I had glory with you, restore me to that position that I had. Instead, here in Christ's high priestly prayer, very clearly we have the distinction between the Father and the Son, and yet the Son knows of a time when in the presence of the Father, before the world existed, he shared the very glory of the Father. Now remember, Yahweh said in Isaiah chapter 45 and Isaiah chapter 48, he will share his glory with none other. And so it would be blasphemous for a mere human nature, let alone an idealized plan, to somehow speak and say, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world was. This is clearly one divine person who has taken on human nature. He has voluntarily made himself of no reputation. 
He has entered into human flesh, and he is about to experience the consummation of that work upon the cross. And then he knows that after that time is the resurrection, the justification of the faithful servant, and his entrance back into the state of glory. That's why he said in John 14, 28, if you, if you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going back to the Father, for the Father is greater than I am. That term greater is positional, not better than I am, but in a greater position than I am. The Father wasn't being followed around by Pharisees, always trying to catch every word he said. He was going back into that presence of the Father that was his in eternity past. Indeed, as I said before, all the prayers of the Lord Jesus demonstrate the distinct personhood of the Son, yet they likewise prove the deity of the Son as well. These are not examples of the human side praying to the divine side, but of a divine yet incarnate person, the Son, communicating with a divine but non-incarnate person, the Father in heaven. Last main text of the three that I want to present, demonstrating the thesis that the Son pre-existed as a divine person before his birth in Bethlehem, John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. We all know John 1.1. 1, 1. You probably have discussed it maybe with some Jehovah's Witnesses who came knocking on the door, woke you up early on a Saturday morning. In the beginning was the word, and arcane halagos. The term ain is the imperfect form of I me. It does not point to a point of origin in time where the word comes into existence. As far back as you push the beginning, the word already was. The word experiences timeless existence. And the word was with God, pros, face to face with. There is a relationship that exists. And notice the use of the word ain again. It is an eternal relationship that exists, as we'll see, between the Father and the Son. The third clause, and the word was God, kaitheia sein halagos, the os, the word was deity. I translate it that way because, for those of you who have studied this, the os comes before the verb. It is a pre-verbal and arthurist predicate nominative. Isn't that wonderful? What does that mean? Generally, it means that it is describing the nature of the subject of the clause. So what does John 1, 1 tell us? The word has eternally existed. The word has relationship with the Father. And the word is as to his nature, deity. Now we want to emphasize that second phrase. Who is the God with whom the word eternally was? This is the Father, as John tells us in John 1.18, the bookend to John 1.1. 1, 1. You have the, you know, you know the bookends you use on a shelf on one side and the other side. That's also a, a common uh, uh, tool in writing to state something at the beginning, you elaborate on it, and then you restate it at the end. What does John 1.18 tell us? No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son. The term is monogenes theos, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. So when it says no one has ever seen God, lots of people in the Old Testament saw God. But John goes on to say, it is God the only Son, the monogenes theos, who is close to the Father's heart, who has exegeted him, explained him, made him known. The God who has not been seen is the Father. But it is God, the only Son, Jesus the Messiah, who is close to the Father's heart, who makes known the Father. The God with whom the, world, the Word eternally existed is, likewise, the Father. Yet this is exactly what John does tell us, for by using the phrase, God, the only Son, in John 1.18, he clearly indicates that the Son is and was deity, and the Son was with the Father from eternity, just as we see in John 1.1. So we have three texts that I firmly believe we must exegete in full this evening. I will challenge Mr. Perkins to give us in-depth, consistent reading of each one of these texts in their context to be able to provide a refutation of the assertion that has been made that each one of these texts, taken in context as they were written, presents the fact that Jesus existed as a divine person prior to his birth in Bethlehem. But I also want to ask two questions to wrap up our discussion and to focus it in our thinking this evening, because we're hopefully not just here this evening to have some kind of uh, abstruse discussion of, of theological 
facts. This is about the gospel. This is about life. Hopefully we're here because we really believe these things matter. I certainly would say that's why I am here this evening. And so I have a couple of questions that would tie this issue directly to what we believe is the gospel. For example, if the Son does not exist as a divine person before the incarnation, then what does Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 mean? Because it says, therefore, when he came into the world, that's the Son, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. You have prepared a body. Who's the you? This is, this, is, this is talking about the preparation of the body. Who prepared the body? The one who took the body is saying, you prepared the body for me. So who is this since this is before the incarnation? I mean, it's talking about the preparation of the body. It's when he came into the world. So who are the people that are described here? I would say to you, this is the son making reference to the father, as the book of Hebrews would very clearly make it, make it known to us. All right? So there's one question. And then very, very importantly, who is the mediator? If Jesus was actually the father in his deity and the son is but a human creature that came into existence in Bethlehem, sinless but still a human creature, not eternal, where is he now? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, speaks of the Son and says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. One of the greatest, most beautiful truths of the Christian faith is that this night, the sinless Son of God, the God-man, the lamb standing as if slain stands in the presence of the Father for me and for every person who has faith in him. And that is the surety of my peace with God. That is the surety of my salvation. It's not found in myself. It's found in the fact that there is one who has entered into the holy place. I am united with him. His sacrifice is my sacrifice. His resurrection is my resurrection. His righteousness is my righteousness. And he stands in the presence of the Father. Finished. It is finished, he said. The lamb standing as if slain. And if I am in him, then the Father sees his son, his work completed. And if I am in him, then I have a perfect relationship with the Father. That's the basis of justification by faith. That's the basis of understanding the basis of God's grace. It's beautiful, but how does it work in oneness theology? Because if the, Jesus was the Father and the Son, then who is Jesus now standing before? Because has the Father left the Son and now the Son's just a human being? And the Father's become the Holy Spirit. And so who is, is, is Jesus now just a, is just a human nature appearing in the presence of the Holy Spirit? That's not what Scripture teaches. And so you see, these are not just side issues for us. These touch on the very gospel itself. So I want to ask you as the audience, focus upon the thesis did the Son exist as a divine person distinguishable from the Father prior to his incarnation? That's the question this evening. Now you see why it's so important. Thank you very much for being here tonight.